Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to our next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference. I'm Dr. Hart Beatty. I uh, chair the APDR Education Committee and I'm the Neural Radiology Fellowship Director at Boston Medical Center. Uh, again, welcome to our next session. Um, again, let's go through a few housekeeping items and then I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, the first is that, as you all know, the webinar is being recorded, as are the questions and comments. Um, the webinar attendees will be muted uh, to ensure optimal quality. If you do have any questions for our presenters, please use the question and answer tool through Zoom, and we will try to uh, get to those questions if we can. Uh, if not, we can try to email you the responses. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. We are unbelievably fortunate to have both of these amazing educators uh, uh, giving talks today. The first uh, clearly is somebody who needs no introduction, um, Dr. Mark Murphy, physician in chief at the AIRP. Um, uh, he'll start the session off with uh, a talk on approach to peripheral arthropathies. We're so grateful for his time. And followed by Dr. Stacy Smith, also an amazing educator um, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, she'll be discussing demystifying bone tumors uh, as an introduction. So without further ado, I will welcome uh, Dr. Murphy to give his uh, talk. I'll stop sharing my screen at this point and uh, invite Dr. Murphy to start sharing his screen. All right, thank you very much, Harp. Hopefully everybody can uh, hear me and see my screen. Yep, it looks great. All right, so we're gonna talk about an approach to peripheral uh, arthropathies. Um, I can't get it to move. How do I advance? What did you do? Left click. So I don't have any disclosures. And um, I do do my clinical work at, uh, at Walter Reed National Military Medical uh, Center. Uh, for um, in Washington, D.C. area, and so I need to give disclosures uh, for that military connection uh, as well, or as I like to call it, the uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, and see no evil uh, equivalent uh, for the government, or you could say I'm from the government and I'm here to help uh, as well. So this is what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to talk about inflammatory arthritis, I will show uh, multiple modalities, but concentrate on radiographs. And what I like to do and teach is uh, what I refer to as the one sentence summary statement for diagnosis. And I think if you can do that, it's extraordinarily useful. Uh, I do three rheumatology conferences around the Washington DC area a month. And I will guarantee you, if you put yourself out there and interact with your clinical colleagues, they are very interested in what you have to say. And I'll talk about MR imaging uh, as well. I hope I don't leave you feeling like this uh, when I'm done. So we'll start with rheumatoid arthritis, adult rheumatoid, which is the most common of the inflammatory arthropathies, more common in women, although as you, after the age of 40 or so, uh, then the distribution gets a little more equal. Uh, I've listed on this slide demographic and some genetic things that predispose one to it. And there are a lot of genetic abnormalities that uh, increase your probability of having rheumatoid arthritis uh, as well. We know this is in general a symmetric arthritis and what we see is uniform or fusiform joint space uh, swelling, which means it's equal from radial to ulnar or medial to lateral. Subluxations are common and then aggressive marginal erosions are often seen. And by aggressive, I mean there's no rheumatoid sclerosis about the margin of the erosion. And in general, no bone production is seen uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I know all of you at your institutions get three pages of history with all of your cases. That would be, no, we don't get any history. And I would uh, tell you that uh, your soft tissues are your guide or your window to be looking for other abnormalities, uh, in fact. And if we look uh, at this case, we can see more obvious soft tissue swelling about a PIP joint on the image to your left and much more subtle soft tissue swelling on your right. And one of the things I would encourage you to look for is to look for the knuckle pads. Uh, 
in a normal PIP joint, you should see the areas of the knuckle pads, which are outlined there. And then I'm going to go back. And when you see early soft tissue swelling, what you will see is effacement and loss of the ability to identify that knuckle pad. Uh, so that can be looked for for early findings of soft tissue uh, swelling. Here, another example with swelling at this site. Notice the loss of the knuckle pads, where you can see the knuckle pads uh, on the other images. So I'll just go back and forth uh, one more time. And that's equivalent to what their, your clinical colleagues are seeing. And you can see the soft tissue swelling and bogginess. And that's why you lose that knuckle pad on your radiographs uh, as well. So look for that. Uh, for early soft tissue swelling. And I would just emphasize, you can see that it's equivalent from radial to ulnar or from medial to lateral, typical of what we see in rheumatoid arthritis. What we know equally important is the distribution of diseases with uh, an arthritis. And for rheumatoid arthritis, we can identify that most commonly the hands are affected and particularly the PIP joints, the MCP joints and the carpus and generally symmetric. Uh, don't forget about the foot. The foot is involved in a high percentage of cases and in about 10 to 20 percent of cases in my experience, the foot is actually earlier uh, to be involved. So don't forget uh, to look at the foot. Now it is said that the majority of erosions will develop fairly early in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and particularly for with aggressive disease even earlier. And I'm going to get back to the importance of that in identifying uh, the inflammatory disease actually before the erosions and really what's driving our use of cross-sectional imaging to identify those earlier stages of disease as well. I'm also mandatory for my residents and, and fellows when you're looking at an arthritis series, I usually say you must magnify or zoom up two radiographs at least. And the ones I usually zoom up in our arthritic series are the frontal radiographs and my uh, ball catcher's view. And if you do not do that, uh, you will miss early changes uh, of inflammatory arthritis. Because our real job is to characterize the arthritis, to confirm the diagnosis, and there may at times be a differential diagnosis, and that's because of the implications on management. Now, cross-sectional imaging is great to look for synovitis because radiographs will only show us joint space narrowing and erosions. We would like to identify the disease earlier when there's just synovitis. And I'm gonna concentrate more on MR uh, than ultrasound uh, this afternoon. Here I have picturally shown a normal joint uh, on your left and an inflamed joint on your right. And you can see the red injected areas representing the synovitis or synovial hypertrophy as well. Now, the reason we get marginal erosions is because that is where we do not have cartilage covering and protecting the overlying bone. And so if I take away what you, what, or we only look at what we see on an x-ray, what we see in an inflammatory arthritis is pan compartmental loss of the joint space, unlike osteoarthritis that gives us asymmetric narrowing. And then we can see the marginal erosions. And we've just shown you why anatomically erosions generally occur at the margins of the joint. Now we're going to look at it in real life in a patient. We're only looking at two joints. One is normal and one is abnormal in these two MCP joints. Hopefully we can appreciate there is uniform joint space narrowing, typical of an inflammatory arthritis, compared to the normal adjacent joint space. Now, unlike the PIP joints where I look for loss of knuckle pads, MCP joints are harder to see soft tissue swelling. What you may see as this case demonstrates is capsular distension and increased soft tissue density. But when I'm worried about soft tissue swelling at the MCP joints, I actually go to my lateral radiograph. And I usually try to use my own body parts as normal. Hopefully they are, but you can see the marked distension dorsally. And I can't tell which MCP joint it is, but I know there is MCP joint swelling when I identify that abnormal, abnormality. Now the question is, are there erosions? And this is where you have to zoom or magnify your images because if you don't, we will miss erosions. And very nicely where the arrows are is loss of that region of the white cortical line that should always be present. Notice it beautifully shown, in fact, on the image on the joint to your right where you see that white intact cortical line. The arrows are outlining intermittent loss of your white cortical line. And sometimes that's referred to as the dot dash appearance. And notice where they are. They are at the margins of the joint. So a typical example of rheumatoid arthritis. Well, here's a test case for you. You've got bilateral hands. You know it's an arthritis because everything's on the film. You can see at the bottom left-hand corner, it says bilateral arthritis. 
And here's the ball catcher's view as well. And hopefully we can all appreciate now where the arrows are, our erosions at the PIP joints and MCP joints. So what I would wanna hear with my one sentence summary statement is the following. And I want my 50,000 foot view. I don't want, oh, I think there's erosion at the third MCP joint. What I wanna hear is this is a symmetric erosive arthritis involving the MCP and PIP joints. And by the way, the carpus was narrowed as well without bone production. In that one sentence, you should now be able to answer the question of what arthritis am I? So I'll get, just give you a minute, what arthritis am I? Well, I'm rheumatoid arthritis because that symmetric disease, and we can see it very nicely with the erosions and the typical distribution and bilateral symmetry is certainly the rule as well. Now, interestingly, erosions tend to occur on the radial side of the radial digits, so the second and third metacarpal heads, whereas as you get to the ulnar digits, the erosions predominate on the ulnar side. And here you can see erosions at the base of the fifth metacarpal and the ulnar styloid as well. I would also point out the increased soft tissue adjacent to the ulnar styloid. That means there's soft tissue swelling because the ulnar soft tissue should never be thicker than the radial soft tissues. And that's usually due to tenosynovitis along the area of the extensor carpi ulnaris. The wrist is very common to show pancarpal narrowing as is demonstrated here. And this is the one exception to the rule where adult rheumatoid may in fact cause osseous ankylosis or bone formation. The carpus and tarsus are the only location that occurs in adult rheumatoid. If you see osseous ankylosis at other sites or bone production, you are in fact not dealing with adult rheumatoid, but a different arthritis. When you look at your feet for rheumatoid arthritis, look your, have your eyes go to the lateral head of the fifth metatarsal. That is often the earliest site of erosion. And again, you see it quite nicely marginally. And if I put up a matched macro section relatively from our archives, you can see the star representing the synovial hypertrophy and erosion and you can see the arrows at the margins of the erosion. And notice it is marginal, it's not a central location. Well, I'm not gonna talk about large joints. In any joint with an inflammatory arthritis, you're gonna see pan-compartmental narrowing, not asymmetric narrowing as you see in osteoarthritis. Hear it nicely in an example of rheumatoid arthritis involving both knees, and we can see the symmetry. And in a macro section from our archives, you can certainly see the diffuse loss of joint space as well. Now, MR imaging has the ability to show us the synovitis before there is actually joint damage with narrowing and marginal erosions. And that's important as we will talk about in just a little bit. Now, acute synovitis usually will enhance relatively rapidly and you want to image fairly early because if you image in a delayed fashion, the contrast can diffuse into the joint and it can be hard to differentiate effusion from synovitis and generally water sensitive sequences so show similar changes. Bone marrow edema is common. I frequently see things I think are bone marrow edema that I believe are overcalled as erosions and sometimes they may certainly be the forerunner of erosion. But pathologically that lymph represents lymphoid infiltration and that can entirely and usually does entirely resolve. Be careful with erosions because I see a lot of things mischaracterized as erosions and I'll show you an example of that. Erosion should be broad based. You should have overlying synovial hypertrophy and you should see it in two planes as well. Now the reason this is all important is because of what our rheumatology colleagues now have to interrupt the disease. If we would have had MR imaging or ultrasound uh, 80 years ago, it would have made no difference to rheumatologists because all they had to treat this disease with was in fact steroids. But now we have multiple other methods to treat these patients. And we now know that there's a window of opportunity, usually within the six months of disease, that if you can treat these patients with the biologic typically or the anti-TNFs, you can interrupt the disease, stop any mechanical or damage to the joint as far as joint space narrowing or erosion, and that will halt any of the subsequent sequelae that may occur. But what we have to do is make sure we're dealing with an inflammatory arthritis that will respond to these medications because in fact, these medications are expensive. 
And in fact, they certainly have complications as well. So you don't wanna treat somebody with osteoarthritis or erosive osteoarthritis with this medication because it won't work and there are potential complications. So in pa patient like this, if they were large and your clinical colleague was not getting a good clinical examination, they may ask us to identify, is there synovitis or not? May this patient have rheumatoid arthritis? Should I treat them aggressively? in fact, as well. And if you ask a rheumatologist today, who's better at identifying synovitis, me or the rheumatologist? And they answer honestly, it is me. It is us, the radiologist, that is actually better at that. So you may see some soft tissue swelling with increased density, and there's certainly joint space narrowing. But the MR makes it absolutely obvious, uh, in fact, that there is a diffuse thick cake around this MCP joint and you can see it enhancing as well. Is there an erosion? Well, the answer to that is yes. And notice it's on the radial aspect and you can see that synovitis causing loss of the dark cortex and notice it's broad based. So that is a true erosion as well. And here you can see a similar case and notice the broad based areas of erosion and loss of the cortex and notice this, we can see it on both coronal and axial images as well. Be careful because I see a lot of things like this called erosions. These are not erosions. When you see a narrow neck going through the cor cortex and a larger subchondral abnormality that is not broad based. Those are normal variations, either vascular grooves going through that region, perhaps a subchondral cyst or intraosseous ganglion, but they are not, again, they are not of erosion related to synovitis. Now, if you image rapidly after contrast, you can differentiate synovitis as is shown here with areas of enhancement from the joint fluid shown by the stars with just a small rim of enhancement nicely demonstrated in this case. This is what we can see with that aggressive therapy. Here is a patient, and I was lucky enough to be involved in this study at the NIH, patients with early rheumatoid arthritis being treated with the biologics and then watching what happens, in fact, with that treatment. So here you can see the synovitis. Notice, in fact, a small single erosion. It enhances with contrast, and you can see it's high signal in the water-sensitive sequence. But notice what's happening after three months and after five months. Is this getting better or worser, as I often like to say? And in fact, clearly it's getting better as we can demonstrate in this example. And this is the power of these biologics is if you can treat the synovitis early enough before there's mechanical damage, you really have gone a great deal of the way to giving the patient almost a cure from their disease because you're not gonna have the subsequent abnormality. I'm trying to use this jump right here, Don, and I can't get to it. Let me just see. Ah. No. Sorry about that, guys. No. No, it won't work there either. No. All right. Let me try it this way. Okay, I'm just gonna skip over this the hard way then. Sorry about that. All right, so now we're gonna move on to psoriatic arthritis and reactive arthritis or the seronegative spondyl arthropathies uh, and uh, reactive arthritis, what we used to call uh, Rider uh, syndrome. Psoriatic arthritis usually presents at the time or the patients had the skin disease uh, before uh, their arthritis starts. And reactive arthritis, I know when I was a resident, I was taught this was almost exclusive or a high predilection for males. That's not true. If you include bowel disease, it's about an equal male to female uh, predilection uh, with reactive arthritis. And what these two diseases have in common is that their distribution is often different than adult rheumatoid in being asymmetric. But what I look for even more carefully in many cases is the associated bone production. And I personally consider that an exaggerated response to try to heal an injury, be it an erosion or an area of inflammation where a ligament or tendon att attaches. And perhaps it's related to the HLA-B27 positivity.
So again, I pictorially shown an inflammatory arthritis to your right and a normal joint to your left. And many of the features we see with the seronegatives are similar to rheumatoid arthritis and that I will see diffuse joint space narrowing. I will see marginal erosions, but what I will start to identify are areas of bone production, which again, I believe are an exaggerated response to try to heal the process. And this is specifically the way you will see bone production and one of the reasons I like bone is I like to say bone isn't very smart. I'm not very smart. Once you learn patterns, this will happen over and over and over again. When bone first forms, it'll be irregular, hair on end, whiskering, if you will. Over time, as it matures, it will do what all bone does as it matures, is it will form an outer cortex and inner trabeculae. And sometimes that's referred to as an excrescence. The third form of bone production is periosteal reaction. And the final one, is osseous ankylosis. I've coned down here to an MCP joint that has joint space narrowing and marginal erosions as well, but I've done an MCP joint because by distribution, you couldn't tell this from rheumatoid from a seronegative spondylarthropathy. But the way you really tell that in this case is, what is the bone doing in response to the inflammation? Well, you can see the fluffy spiculated irregularity whiskering, if you will, at the enthesial attachments. That's just not something you would never see in adult rheumatoid arthritis. And in addition, you can see an area of os ex excrescence. Notice that that area has an attempt at forming a cortex. It has internal trabeculae. It is much more mature than the whiskering. And that can take a little time to form. And in fact, I can show it to you very clearly between the arrows because between the arrows is bone that's been added on in response to the erosion that's more proximal at this MCP joint. So now I have an inflammatory erosive arthritis with bone production. This is not gonna be rheumatoid. This is going to be psoriatic arthritis. You can see maintenance of the mineralization as well. I will tell you when I'm looking at imaging, while I know that I'm supposed to look for early osteopenia and rheumatoid arthritis versus maintenance in the seronegatives, it's the thing I hang my hat on least as a radiologist. And the reason for that is because it's the most subjective thing I look at as a radiologist. I can guarantee you I can make anybody look osteopenic to you just by changing the contrast on the computer. These are the five ways psoriatic arthritis can present to you or me as a radiologist or a clinician. And very commonly, DIP and PIP joint involvement, either symmetric or asymmetric, or an oligo or ray distribution. Reactive arthritis, on the other hand, likes the lower extremities. It likes the feet. It likes the interphalangeal joints of the feet and the MTP joints, the calcaneus and the sacroiliac joints. So here's another test case. I'm showing you these hands. Hopefully you can appreciate where there is some soft tissue swelling. And now I'll cone down a bit where is there soft tissue swelling? Notice the loss of the pads around the interphalangeal joints and the DIP joints here as well. So I clearly have a area of an inflammatory disease and we can see erosions and more importantly, bone production. And I would tell you to look at the margins of the cortex where the arrows are versus the margins of the cortex at that long finger DIP joint. And notice the fluffy irregularity, that is bone production. So now if I was to give my, what's my one sentence summary statement, this is an inflammatory, erosive, asymmetric arthritis involving multiple hand DIP and IP joints with bone production, what arthritis am I? Well, I'm gonna be psoriatic arthritis because reactive arthritis likes the lower extremities as a predominance much more than the upper extremity. Here an example of psoriatic arthritis with that whiskering at multiple areas. And because this bone production is occurring circumferentially, I can get an ivory phalanx as well because of the increased density and increased bone. And you can see some ivory phalanges here, which is said to occur in 25 to 30% of patients with psoriatic arthritis, although it can occur in reactive arthritis as well. And you can see it also on the DIP joint to your right, that whiskering from that bone production, trying to repair the erosions at the margin of the joint. Here an erosion, there an excrescence. This happened a while ago because it's not fluffy and irregular. This has sometimes been referred to as the Mickey Mouse ear phenomena. And here's my RADPATH correlation and I have to take it down quickly because that's a patent violation. 
Here you can see a patient with fusion of the tarsus. Now that could be adult rheumatoid, as I told you, but if you look at the CT, notice the irregularity, the whiskering are on the margins. The osseous ankylosis could be adult rheumatoid or a seronegative spondyloarthropathy, but that whiskering around the margins compared to the normal cortex should tell you that this is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy. In this case, this is, uh, this is uh, psoriatic arthritis. We can get arthritis mutilans as well, and you can see the cup and pencil deformity uh, as well. Another form of soft tissue swelling we can see with psoriatic and reactive arthritis is the sausage digit. And you can see the diffuse swelling of these digits from the MCP to the tip of the finger. And you can see the third form of bone production, which is the periosse reaction. And you can see similar features here in this toe quite nicely with this swollen toe and the matched clinical feature uh, features on your right. Now there are several reasons I went into radiology. Certainly a couple of them are, I didn't want to have to look at that. And I certainly didn't want to have to touch that either because that's just disgusting. So uh, radiology is a great field, uh, in fact, as well. When you're looking at your MR imaging, I like to extrapolate to what I know on radiographs about distribution of disease. And I just go back to what I know on radiographs. And here's an example of that. On the top image to your left is a thickening around a flexor tendon from the I, uh, DIP joint to the MTP joint and synovitis. At the bottom left lower portion is a normal tendon. Very nicely on the MIP images, I can in fact see that this is a ray distribution of disease, a dactylitis, if you will. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the future, if you will. I'm gonna say, I know that's the distribution of a seronegative spondyloarthropathy, and that's a patient with psoriatic arthritis. Here we can see an example of that spiculated irregularity quite nicely as well in a patient with reactive arthritis, both at the IP joint of the great toe and an MTP joint uh, as well. And we can see similar things in the inferior calcaneus as well. I'm gonna go back, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to get out because I can't figure out how to do this any other way. So let me just go back to our final test case. And I apologize for my all right. All right, so this is our final test case, a 40-year-old. Hopefully you can appreciate their soft tissue swelling and you can appreciate there's erosions. And from what I've shown you so far, I would say this is an inflammatory erosive arthritis. It's symmetric, it involves the PIP joints and MCP joints. And if I was to ask you which arthritis is it, I would say it's rheumatoid arthritis from that description. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna zoom up because I'm gonna tell you if you do not zoom up, if you do not magnify, you will miss things like this. What are those in those regions? Well, those are areas of bone production. And so now if I change my explanation to be more correct, this is an inflammatory erosive arthritis with bone production, can I be rheumatoid arthritis? And the answer is no. And because the hands have polyarticular involvement, it's not gonna be reactive arthritis. This is psoriatic arthritis. And this is the rare variety that parallels, at least by distribution, rheumatoid, which is quite unusual. So what I've tried to do is give you my one sentence summary report. I will tell you, if you use those rules, it will very much help you categorize and be in the right ballpark for the distribution of disease. Don't forget to magnify your images. When you're looking at cross-sectional imaging, MR ultrasound, just extrapolate what you know about the arthritis from what you're seeing. We just see the inflammation and the synovitis much more exquisitely. And that's really important to try to identify the disease earlier today because of the medications your rheumatologists in fact have to interrupt the disease. I thank you so much for your attention. I hope you didn't consider this joint war warfare and I hope I didn't feel you, feel you, let, leave you feeling like this either. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. This is a talk that usually covers about two hours. So this is the part 
one of four and will be an introduction to demystifying bone lesions. And we're going to look at some of the characteristics of benign and malignant bone lesions. Um, in the second portion, we'll talk about some of them in the first portion of this half hour today. And we're going to look at some as a case-based format. As you know that lesions in bone typically can be categorized not only by tissue type, but by their predilection for specific ages. And I've given you this slide here showing some of the uh, common cases in patients younger than 20, that of fibrous cortical defect or non-ossifying fibroma, chondroblastoma, fibrous dysplasia, with the most common malignant lesions in this group being leukemia, Ewing sarcoma, and osteosarcoma, as well as those we see in the younger patients, such as retinoblastoma, neuroblastoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, or rhabdomyosarcoma. When we hit the 20 to 40 year range, the more prevalent types of diseases are enchondroma, giant cell tumor, osteoblastoma, with the osteosarcomas and adamantinomas occurring in this age group. And finally, greater than 40, the malignant lesions tend to be more commonly metastatic or myeloma, the M&Ms, with Paget disease or non-Hodgkin lymphoma, chondrosarcoma, and secondary diseases present. We also talk about location, and this is an image from one of the archival uh, chapters on bone lesions that shows very nicely some of the typical diaphyseal lesions, you know, for example, fibrous dysplasia or adamantinoma in the tibia, the metaphyseal lesions, our fibrous cortical defect, osteochondroma extending away from the joint, several different intramedullary lesions such as simple bone cyst or enchondroma, and then finally the list that are at the epiphysis, kind of our sine qua is our giant cell tumor, your chondroblastoma in a child, and then subchondral cystic changes. So I've categorized the areas that we want to mentally think about when we look at bone lesions into these uh, seven categories, and we will probably get to cover the top four during this talk. So patterns of destruction. There are three specific patterns. They're geographic, moth-eaten, and permutative. We'll go through these one by one, starting by geographic. There are geographic uh, lesions that are categorized according to their margin. So in this case, on your left, is a category margin 1A. This is a very innocuous, benign-looking lesion. You can draw your your arrow around it. With a 1B, we actually don't have the sclerosis around the lesion, but you can still identify a margin between the native bone and the area of abnormality. When finally a geographic 1C is becoming that smudged margin where it's indistinct or not, a, it's a, got a wider transition zone. This is a nice example of a transitional, narrow zone of transition at a 1A. This is a classic fibrosanthoma. This occurs in the uh, distal diametaphysis of long bones, this characteristic lobular smooth sclerotic margin with lobulated areas, cystic change extending from the cortical margin. And this becomes sclerotic over time and usually heals by about 25 years of age. It occurs in a younger age group as a result, and the complication would be a fracture through this site. But there's no periosteal reaction or other abnormal finding. On MRI, we can see that this is a fibrous lesion. It is contiguously dark on all sequences, even fat-saturated sequences. And you can see that lobular sclerotic margin in this fibrous cortical defect, which is less than two centimeters in size. The giant cell tumor, uh, if which is a, an epiphyseal lesion, is a nice example of a 1B in this case. We can identify the epiphyseal lesion, this bubbly lytic lesion within the distal radius, but as you can see, it's smudged within the margin of the metatapheseal extension. Similarly, in the distal femur, we can see an epiphyseal metaphyseal lesion with expansion, and we can't really find that sclerotic margin as well as we can see in the epiphysis. So a nice example of the sclerosis, and remember this is purely lytic typically, about 80% are well-defined. They have this pseudotrabecular and soft tissue extension is frequent. 
And remember that for one of our epiphyseal lesions. This is an ex example of a geographic 1C. This is a chondrosarcoma of the femur. And how do we know it's a chondrosarcoma? Well, we see this kind of rings and arcs. It's a little confusing in that it almost looks like it could be flocculated like an osteosarcoma. But in this case, there is so much lysis and that we can see areas where there may be a border and then we lose the border completely as we can see here without cortical breakthrough or periosteal reaction at this particular time. As we become more aggressive, we move on to the moth-eaten or permeative type pattern where we can see these permeative holes throughout the cortex, more commonly in the permeative rather than the moth-eaten type appearance. This is a patient, you can see the surgical clips in the axilla, history of breast cancer, and we, there we can identify these areas of permeative holes within the proximal diaphysis in keeping with that moth-permeative type pattern in a patient with breast carcinoma and metastasis static disease. Lymphoma is really a beautiful example of this permeative moth eaten appearance on radiographs. We don't see the beautiful cortical margin of the distal acromion. It appears enlarged and we can see on CT the beautiful channels that go from soft tissue into bone destroying the cortex of the scapular spine and the large area of uptake on the uh, FDG PET and the large area of soft tissue mass, which we can see on MR very nicely extending about this lesion. Ewing sarcoma is another example of a uh, moth permeative lesion, periosteal reaction showing the aggressive nature, the moth permeative appearance, and here we can see the marked extent of soft tissue extension and the periosteal reaction. You need to do MRI on these cases to identify the extent of this disease, both within the bone and in soft tissue for surgical and other treatment. And this is one of the round blue cell tumors typically seen in younger patients. It's one of the lesions that can occur in the diaphysis and more commonly in the diaphysis, although we tend to see it in the metadiaphysis. And it's really uh, uh, signified by these cortical channels, which are beautifully seen on axial images. And you can see here where the soft tissue mass is extending and connecting with the intermedullary component. And we can see on MR how large that soft tissue component is. Ewing sarcoma is also known to be a flat bone lesion. As we see in this case, there is abnormal marrow replacement of the right iliac bone. We can see the soft tissue component on the T2 fat saturated sequence. And here we can see post contrast, the enhancement of bone and soft tissue with areas of vascular channels coming through that iliac wing. Lymphoma similarly and leukemia are also lesions that extend through cortical channels and have a soft tissue an intramedullary component and both leukemia and lymphoma can look quite similar having this replacement of marrow, periosteal reaction, and extension of bone through cortical channels. Multiple myeloma is noted by these multiple lytic lesions. They can give endosteal scalloping. You can see it in multiple sites and METS myeloma, but in this case we would probably suspect more the multiple myeloma in a patient who is of an older age. Let's now move to periosteal reaction. There is both benign and malignant types. Benign, of course, is no periosteal reaction or a very solid appearing uh, periosteum. Whereas malignant, we have several names we tend to give to it, lamellated or onion skin, codman triangle, and aggressive sunburst. This is a two-year-old patient who was limping, and we can see solid linear periosteal reaction as shown by the arrows in this patient who had had a healing toddler's fracture, which is signified by benign solid bone formation and is common in this age group in the two-year-olds who are walking and scrambling around. This case was a little more confusing. You can see this thick lobular bone along the cortice of the distal medial tibia, and you can see almost circumferential uh, cortical margin. And this was a little worrisome, thought this could be infection. Is it chronic infection? But they also had a pylon fracture, which was subacute. They did have high white blood cell count, and they did have a little marrow change. However, this was negative on the nuclear medicine white blood cell count, and the patient was thought to have chronic uh, acquiesced osteomyelitis and superimposed on healing uh, fracture of the tibia, not acute infection. So you can use different modalities to help answer your questions. In this case, there is solid bone formation. It is not infection, 
but it matches very nicely where our tendon attachment is for the hamstring. And then in this case, a history of running and pain in the back of the thigh, ex exactly in this area is consistent with history of an avulsion fracture, uh, avulsion injury to the right hamstring with prominent healed heterotopic ossification. When we see linear bone formation along the cortex that is slightly irregular, not the beautiful solid uh, lesion that we saw in that toddler's fracture, but in multiple long bones, this should give you a clue that this is a systemic disorder. This is not going to be a focal malignancy to this bone in particular, but it is a worry because it is a secondary finding of lung carcinoma known as hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. And your bone scan, as well as an immediate chest radiograph, could give you that diagnosis. So be very wary when you see something that linear, try to look at the other side. Looking at our more quintessential uh, malignant type of periosteal reaction, this is the lamellated or onion skin appearance in patient with Ewing sarcoma of the proximal humerus, usually seen in younger patients. The Codman triangle in this case is seen as the uplifting of periosteum in a patient with an osteosarcoma, which had a more lytic component than expected, such as uh, can be seen in telangiectatic sarcomas. Sunburst periosteal reaction is exactly what it sounds like, this irregular and spanned uh, sunburst type of appearance of sunburst reaction in this patient with an osteosarcoma shown by this flocculent osteoid production and extension through the cortex and reactive effusion. Since we've looked at that matrix now, let's look at how we identify really logically what kind of matrix we have in these particular lesions. And we're going to start with osteoids since we saw that one already. And we can look at these just in general. Let's look at osseous mineralization overall. You can have a solid area of osseous mineralization in bone. You can have a cloud-like uh, lesion or it can become completely sclerotic such as in an ivory type appearance and this was the case where we saw a flocculent area and focal solid area with areas of extension of solid malignant osteoid. Osteosarcoma as you know has several different types the conventional type as we've just seen the telangiectatic which has a more lytic type appearance and can mimic aneurysmal bone cyst or giant cell tumor typically seen in younger patients it can be multifocal it can have multiple areas so we need to look at the entire bone including both articular surfaces and it, we can also have surface osteosarcomas which are less common including the parosteal and periosteal remembering that parosteal are in younger patients and usually a better prognosis and we tend to see those most commonly in the posterior distal uh, femur. Note the osteosarcomas that typically appear near growth plates of long bones, the distal femur, the proximal tibia, the proximal humerus. We also see them though in the face and the jaw, uh, jaw and the skull and in the pelvis. An example of how we must stage osteosarcomas we need an MRI of the entire bone to look for skipped lesions. We can have multiple sclerotic lesions throughout bone. We need a chest CT to look for lung metastasis and a bone scan to look for bone mats or multifocal primary disease in order to best treat these. Biopsy is best performed at the institution of treatment because the imp improper biopsy can result in amputation of potentially a salvageable limb and surgical resection is typical. We use chemotherapy to manage a micrometastatic disease which is present but often not detectable at diagnosis. So just an example of the types of osteosarcomas, the typical osteoblastic type appearance is seen about just less than half of the patients. 30% have this osteolytic type appearance and about a quarter can have this mixed appearance in bone. This is an example of the telangiectatic type of lesion with the lytic areas with extension beyond bone. It can have these quintessential fluid fluid levels, which can also be seen in aneurysmal bone cyst and, and in giant cell tumors. So biopsy is critical in making this diagnosis. The parosteal osteosarcoma 
is classically known as this lobular bone formation, posterior diametaphysis of the femur. And we can see here the bone extension on the gross specimen. And we can see that it's typically in a younger age group than we typically see in other sarcomas. So I'm going to give you a question here. Which of the following are true regarding parosteal osteosarcoma? Number one, it's the most common form of surface osteosarcoma. It does it occur in young adults and it's often low grade. Is it slow growing mass, painless, ache with limited range of motion due to interference with the joint? Treatment is wide surgical removal, chemotherapy if higher tumor grade. And does it have the best survival rate of surface osteosarcomas? And the answer is all of the above. Another question, which is true. Parosteal osteosarcoma demonstrates peripheral sclerosis followed by central ossification. Parosteal osteosarcoma occurs primarily in the diaphysis. Parosteal osteosarcoma demonstrates early central sclerosis with outward growth of ossification. Or myositis ossificans starts centrally, then ossifies peripherally. And if we think about how this disease develops, it's always central sclerosis with outward growth of ossification. We'll show an example. A patient had complained of a growing mass and discomfort within the lateral elbow. Initial radiograph showed this peripheral area of sclerosis. You can see a little bit of that peripheral sclerosis on the lateral image. Follow-up studies in seven months then demonstrated this filling in now of the central component. So this is myositis ossificans, not parosteal osteosarcoma due to that peripheral sclerosis. Parosteal osteosarcoma can be a little bit confusing in some cases when it's quite proliferative and circumferential. When you look at it first, in this case on the AP and lateral, you would automatically know this is an osteosarcoma, this is sclerotic osteoid, but on the CT, you can see it, it's completely surface related, not intramedullary. So this is a circumferential parosteal osteosarcoma. The other kind of surface lesion is a periosteal osteosarcoma, which is not as common. This is seen in a 38-year-old woman. You can see saucerization of the lesion along the cortical margin. You can see the periosteal sunburst reaction. And notice that it is in the diaphysis, and it can be diametaphyseal as well. Advanced imaging can confirm that surfaced appearance of these lesions, in this case, the periosteal osteosarcoma. And you can see the per periosteal bone formation and the soft tissue component on this MRI. Let's move on to our other kinds of matrix. The next most common are cartilaginous with the typical arcs and rings. Chondral mineralization can have a stippled appearance. It can be flocculent or it can be this ringed and arced, which is classic. In this case, we do see some rings and arcs. It's centrally located. We don't see any endosteal scalloping here. We may see a little endosteal scalloping along the margin. And always look for that on your radiographs, particularly to identify if it's greater than 50% of the cortical loss or if there's any soft tissue breakthrough. Advanced imaging can help clarify as to whether there is cortical involvement, but it also beautifully shows the areas of mucinous material in the matrix that shows a bit bright like fluid on our fluid sensitive sequences with areas of dark persistent signal in the areas of the now uh, mineralizing areas of cartilage in this typical enchondroma. This one was a little hard at first. We looked at it and thought that looked more flocculent. And as you look more closely, there are little rings and arcs. There's areas of lucency. There's no endosteal scalloping. But if you put that in the middle of the bone, you'd probably say that's most likely an enchondroma. And look on MR where you can see these lobular areas of cartilage with that beautiful shiny matrix of mucinous cartilaginous material showing up very bright on this fluid sensitive sequence. And now you can see the endosteal scalloping so much better. It does not have cortical breakthrough, but this is considered a low grade cartilaginous lesion. When we come to what makes a aggressive cartilaginous lesion, this case, basically uh, depicts all of the things we're looking for. There's a large area of intramedullary rings and arcs. There is 
periosteal reaction, which is irregular. There is cortical breakthrough, as we can see in here, and there's cortical loss. So we not only see the cartilage, we see endosteal scalloping, and we see the cortical destruction in both the AP and lateral views in this case. We can identify the extent of lesions on bone scan and identify the area on PET CT in order to identify areas that need to be treated and the degree of resection. You can see the degree of cortical breakthrough with soft tissue component, and this is best seen with IV contrast in these cases. Here you can see the intermedullary uh, cartilaginous lesion, the diffuse soft tissue component extending out along the distal femur. This is the appearance of that matrix, which is mucinous in appearance, and appears very bright on our T2 and fat-saturated sequences, and you can see the glistening component of this on our gross specimens. This is the cartilage with these vacuoles of cartilaginous material in the histologic specimen. So we typically see these clinically with pain and a specific mass are seen more commonly in males and females, about three to, one, to two, average age about 40 to 45 years, and more commonly within the metaphysis, although we do see chondrosarcomas in the femur, the pelvis, the shoulder, the ribs and sternum, and vertebra. They can show as geographic 1A to 1C to permeative. They're often predominantly sclerotic. Look for that deep endosteal scalloping. Look for periosteal reaction, expansile modeling, and a soft tissue mass occurs to 20 to 75% of patients. The chondroid matrix should really give you that clue. We see about 80% of this by x-ray, 94% by CT. MR, again, that lobular appearance, matrix calcification with low signal intensity, and peripheral and septal contrast enhancement. we are showing another example of a type of tissue. This is a fibrous lesion. On radiographs, we see it as this smudged kind of ground glass appearance. Sometimes you can see the border very well. And we can see this in the diaphysis. And the diaphysis is a very unusual location for lesions. We've already mentioned that Ewing sarcoma can occur in the diaphysis, multiple myeloma can occur in the diaphysis, and fibrous dysplasia can occur in the diaphysis. This is that smudged appearance. It is endosteal scalloping. There's no aggressive periosteal reaction. This is benign fibrous dysplasia. Fatty lesions can also show as lytic lesions on radiographs, but they have specific locations that may help us. This is a classic location for a calcaneal lipoma, has sclerotic margins, the central tissue is similar to that of fat on our CT, and it can show some areas of sclerosis centrally. This uh, diagnos differential diagnosis on this particular uh, image would be a calcaneal cyst. Another combined lesion that we can identify and help our colleagues out is that of the liposclerosing myxoid fibrous tumor. The intertrochanteric region is the most common location. They typically have a sclerotic portion. They can have lytic areas, they can have cystic areas, and this area um, is very classic. They do have a malignant potential about 10 to 16 percent. So if they are painful, it's worthwhile following these, and in particular in patients who had these, follow them not every year, but over time if there is a particular symptom. I'm just going to talk about epiphyseal lesions and then we will end. The epiphyseal lesions tend to have a really nice uh, differential diagnosis. And these include giant cell tumor, ABC, chondroblastoma, kind of in the same breath, bubbly lytic lesions of the epiphysis. We have subchondral cysts or geodes or lytic lesions due to infection. Others are, include osteoblastoma and erosions erosions that could occur in arthritic disease, just like Dr. Murphy talked about, or potentially in infection. So here we've got our physis, a giant cell tumor can go above, but it's one of those that includes the epiphysis. And so let's look at that. Epiphyseal lesion, it's lytic. You almost miss it because the patella is hiding over top of it. It's not as well seen actually on the uh, lateral view, but here you can identify if you look closely, that is the margin. Yes, it does not have a sclerotic margin up here, but this is certainly not the same density as the diaphyseal lesion. The MRI is beautiful in that it shows these fluid, fluid levels. It very clearly shows these bubbly lytic lesions within the distal dia, dia, uh, sorry, meta-epiphysis. 
And again, just like we saw before, you have these pseudotrabeculae. It can have soft tissue extension. This did not, and typically looks purely lytic on radiographs. Aneurysmal bone cyst can also be seen in the distal radius, but also in the apophyseal equivalents in the pelvis or in the femoral head, uh, in the iliac wing, where we see expansion and lysis and lytic lesions with septae within these bones and the classic fluid fluid levels on our fluid sensitive sequences. Age becomes a very important factor when we are trying to delineate which lesion is which in the epiphysis. This patient came in with pain within the right knee and you can see, or sorry, in the left knee, in the right knee, you can see the cortices of the distal femur beautifully. In this patient on the other side, we lose that lateral condylar margin and we can see a lytic lesion with sclerotic margin. And if you look carefully, you can see little cartilage flex in there. On the lateral view, now you can see much better the epiphyseal lesion and areas of subtle sclerosis centrally. The CT is beautifully identifying this lobular scalloped peripheral sclerotic margin, the central areas of rings and arcs on both the sagittal and axial CT. MR shows area of diffuse edema around chondroblastomas. They are extremely painful. It's what brought this patient in to see us, and you can see the lesion as well. So I'm going to stop there and want to thank everybody for coming out today. I see almost 600 and plus people here. So I, I hope that you're getting some good educational tools during this time of COVID. Uh, it's delightful to be a part of that educational process and I'm really grateful to the APDR for having us come speak to you today and wish you well during this time. Be safe, be well. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We're so grateful for you taking the time out um, for a great talk. Uh, just as a reminder, um, all the talks are being recorded and they will be posted on the APDR YouTube channel uh, to view uh, on demand for free. And uh, we look forward to our next session on, um, on Tuesday. Thanks so much, everybody, and be well.